welcome to The Kitchen Table, a show dedicated to helping you escape diet culture, gain trust with food, honor your body, and live a brighter life. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to The Kitchen Table. I am so glad you're here. I'm your host, Alicia Brown, an anti-diet registered dietitian nutritionist. And today I am so excited. I've got Sarah Zolden here. She is a love coach. And you know, here on the show, we talk about, you know, food and body stuff, all of our struggles, anxieties, and frustrations that we deal with regarding the ways that we eat, the ways that we look, and how it impacts how we live. But what we haven't talked about is love and relationships, because guess what? I am not a love and relationship guru. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know anything about this, right? Like, it's so, so important to talk about, like, you know, the ways that we find love. And I know that so many of you listening on the show, in our conversations, either in the DMs or with my clients, it's like we hit this block when it comes to letting somebody else in, letting somebody love us and accept us in the bodies that we in and that we're in the ways that we eat, you know, like have letting somebody else in to our work in intuitive eating our work and accepting our body. That's a really vulnerable thing. And it's something that we need to talk about in a big way. And this is a huge conversation and we need Sarah's help with this, right? <laughs> so Sarah Zolden, thank you so much for being here. I'm just so excited to unpack what love looks like at any size can you just tell us exactly how you came to be this love coach? And can you explain it just a little rundown on who you are and what you're about and how you came to be? For sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And I love your energy and how excited you are to have this conversation. So I feel like it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. (laughs) I'm pumped. (laughs) Awesome. All right. Yeah. So my favorite sport growing up was sitting on the couch with a really good book. Um, You could not pay me to go to the gym. I was like the last kid chosen for any sports team. And I hated exercise. For me, exercise was directly associated with the treadmill, with kickboxing, with step class. That's what was in when I was in high school, which is super cool if you enjoy it, but I did not. And when I was moving from Toronto, where I'm from, to California, Um, I felt like this transition would be a good time to incorporate some movement into my life. And I had read an article about CrossFit, was intrigued by the weightlifting concept, decided to try it out, fell in love. Like any good CrossFitter, all I did was talk about CrossFit. (laughs) And with time, I realized that we don't, the community that I was in really didn't prioritize fitness because it wasn't about how does exercise make me feel physically, mentally, and emotionally. It was about what can exercise give me in terms of weight loss. And for most people, it's not like you go to the gym, you run a half hour on the treadmill, you come home, you're two pounds down, right? That's just not the way it works. And so it's typically the first thing to go. And so I really was doing this from a place of like, let me incorporate some movement Um, yeah, my hope at that point was that I would lose a a little bit of weight. I have always been in a bigger body. Um, I always identified as fat, but I definitely fall in the small fat category. Um, and so for me, CrossFit was really about discovering how incredibly capable Mm. and strong my body is outside of weight loss. And that really kind of open, open me up to what fitness is all about. Became a CrossFit coach, started coaching women. My very first client was actually the one who introduced me to intuitive eating, which is funny because she kept telling me about it for a long time before I actually was ready to explore it. Because up until that point, I was a weight neutral fitness coach, like by fluke because I couldn't promise my clients. Typically, I was living in LA at the time. And in LA, pretty much every um, fitness coach is also giving their clients like um, meal plans and and that sort of guidance, which is totally, totally out of their um, scope of, of practice and like, so not what anyone should be doing. But that's all I saw. That's what I was trained to do. And so 
that's what I wanted to do, but I couldn't promise my clients that they would lose weight when I could never sustain my weight loss. Like I've been dieting since I'm in sixth grade. And every time I get, you know, lost weight, gained back more than I lost, lost weight, gained back more than I lost. And so I was like, I, I just don't have what to offer my clients. So I was continuously on the lookout for that, like, perfect thing that would work. You know, obviously, I wasn't looking for a diet, I was looking for a lifestyle change and a meal plan. <laughs> um, anyway, so when my client told me about intuitive eating, all I heard in my head was mindful eating, which to me, meant chewing your food for thir- like 30 times before you swallow and not reading the back of a cereal box while you're eating breakfast. And I was like, it's just not realistic. That's not for me. Yeah. And at a certain point, like she wore me down and she, like I would see her with intuitive eating workbook and she would tell me how amazing she feels. And she would tell me she has five kids. And so she would tell me like how she's implementing it in her family. And then she probably got into like DOR a little bit, division of responsibility for her kids. Yeah. It was really interesting. And then I was like, okay, I probably need to check this out. And that just led me straight down the rabbit hole of like health at every size and body positivity. And then I was like, oh, this is cool. This is what I've been looking for my whole life. This is the truth. Um, And then I became an intentional weight neutral fitness coach. And what really bothered me was seeing all the single women who were coming to me solely because they wanted to lose weight for dating. They were told by the people around them that if they wanted to find love, if they wanted to find their soulmate, they would need to lose weight. And I come from a community that is pretty religious where we marry off um, uh, pretty, we get married pretty young and we're very often set up by matchmakers or by family members and friends and stuff like that. So it's very much of a match up situation and how you look and what your size is plays a very, very, very important role, which funnily enough is very incongruent with our religious values. Um, but I guess that's like where we just take us, you know, just have to say like, that's, society's effect on our community. Ah. And I realized that on social media, I had kind of been positioning myself, I guess, more of a social influencer than as a fitness coach who has a service to offer. And so for a long time, as someone who I was single at the time, I dated for 10 years. um, And I was constantly being rejected due to my size constantly being told by matchmakers that if I just lost 10 pounds, you know, it'd be so much easier to set me up and constantly being told by family members that, you know, I'd be so much prettier if I was thinner or they had the perfect guy for me, but he wanted someone thin. And so I realized that on social media, I was like using it as my soapbox (laughs) and just really talking very passionately, talking about that issue of of focusing on weight and size when it comes to love, because while we get the messages that weight and size are so important, when we look around, reality shows us that fat people fall in love and get married every single day. And so I was like, why are we driving ourselves crazy and pursuing something that is really, really, really unrealistic for most of us to pursue, which is a body type that we're not meant to be in an effort to satisfy someone else's like ideal of what we should look like just in order to find love, which we can totally find without pursuing that ideal. Um, So yeah. So once I realized I was like, I'm really just ranting about this a lot more than I'm offering fitness coaching. Um, and I was like, this is where my heart is. I've been there. Um, and right around the time that I actually said I need to make this official pivot, I was actually dating um, my boyfriend at the time, my first like real long, long-term long relationship. And we got married in, uh, we got engaged March 1st of this year, um, which was again, right around the time that I was making that pivot. And we got engaged in August. So planned a COVID wedding and all that. Um, and I'm so happy that I made that official change in terms of coaching because this, this is where my heart is. The way that you just smiled after sharing that makes me feel just so warm. (laughs) And I, 
I can't help but just feel like so inspired by your story, how you came to find movement with a weight neutral approach mm-hmm. to CrossFit, how you found intuitive eating through a client that you were coaching that encouraged you time and time again to pursue intuitive yeah. eating, the resilience that you built up after finding, you know, like after hearing the messages about like losing weight to find mm-hmm. love for so mm-hmm. long, for, for a decade until you actually found the love of your life that you yeah. recently got married to, right? Like. Mm-hmm. This is such a story of triumph, of success and victory. And it's, I, I want to talk more about that, that resilience piece. You said that you were like, and I want to hear about your community, actually, like how <laughs> you work with matchmakers, right? Yeah. To like find this yeah. and how you were like given this advice. And tell me about like how that advice like felt to you and your body and how you were able to maybe reject some of those dieting messages. Yeah. Um, I will say straight up that I think like, I, I genuinely believe this is just a gift. I've always, you know, had like a, a pretty healthy self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, my mother was very much health focused, but she was never about the looks. So even though I was put on diets at a young age, it really, really was from, from, like she did what she thought was the best thing for me based on what my doctor actually told her um, about my weight. And so the mess, I definitely, definitely got mess like fat phobic messages, but they weren't directly from like my, my mother, you know, and they weren't doctor to your mother, to you. Right. And definitely extended family, but not like, like, I think parents are honestly the most, um, impactful for better or for worse. Um, and I think like when I talk to my clients, when we talk about where are these messages coming from, whose voice do you hear in your head when you hear that you can't find love, you know, at your current size. And it's usually, it's either my mother or my father. And so I'm really grateful that I didn't have that experience. And I've just always been like a strong believer, I guess I could say. So I knew from the moment I started dating, um, and I guess in this way, like I, my, my religion really helped me, but I felt really, really strongly that God would send me my Mr. Right at the right time that like, he knows my address and whenever it's meant to be, it'll be. So I never doubted that. Yeah. But what's interesting is that, so that's really where I had that confidence. And I realized very early on, every time I went to matchmaker, I came away feeling like rejected and a little let down. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that none of them ever actually made suggestions. And so at a certain point, I was like, I'm going to stop putting myself in that situation over and over and over again. And so I stopped going to meet matchmakers. And I said, okay, let me give the online dating a shot. Um, Let me give single singles events a shot, you know, obviously pre COVID. Um, And I, again, I also realized like when I went to dating events, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident. I'm very comfortable, comfortable flirting with the guys. And I don't have an issue walking up to someone and starting a conversation. But again, because of the community I come from, like that isn't really the norm in this kind of setting. It's kind of like, you need to wait for them to come over to you and whatever that's for another conversation. But because of the dynamics and the way it's set up, I just, again, left the singles events feeling like that was a waste of time. No one looked my way. I don't like how this makes me feel. I'm not doing this anymore. So this is one of the things that I actually work on with my clients. It's creating a dating plan that works for them. Don't do what makes you feel awful. And so for some people, it's exactly the other way. Like some people feel awful dating online because it's dating online is honestly a numbers game. So once you know that, and you can go into it saying like, okay, nine out of 10 people I match with, are not even like are off the table. It's Mm -hmm. that one or two, eight to nine are like, forget about them. So it's the one or two that may or may not respond back. Once you understand the numbers you're working with, it it becomes a lot less personal, Mm -hmm. but even so it can get really overwhelming. There's, there's definitely a lot of rejection to be had online. And so some people say, I don't want to do online dating, in which case sometimes I do, you know, suggest, well, maybe look at a matchmaker. And I just want to like put it out there. The matchmakers I was working with is very different than the matchmakers I suggest. The ones that I worked with, the way, the way it works in my community for the most part is 
you don't actually pay to meet the matchmaker. The matchmaker gets paid when they make a match. So both parties pay once they get engaged. Um, and it's typically a very short dating. There's a very short courtship. So it's like, you know, anywhere from like three weeks to two to three months is pretty typical. Um, so with that being said, it makes sense for them. And I understand from their perspective why they do it. It makes sense that they just set up the easiest matches because that's where the money is. And I don't think this is intentional on their part. It just kind of what happens. This, the matchmakers that I suggest my clients work with are matchmakers who, you know, it's, it's not cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but you pay up front, you pay an ongoing like monthly fee or whatever it is. And the matchmaker really gets to know you, takes the time, follows up with you every single week, vets the potential matches, make sure that everyone's on the same page in terms of what they're looking for. It's a much more in-depth process so that they're actually getting quality, qualified matches. Um, but I don't remember what my point was. Hang in there a second. Um, yeah, so for me, it was really a matter of figuring out what works for me and what doesn't work for me. Yeah. And then just continuing down that path, kind of ignoring what everyone else says to me. Um, about what I quote unquote should be doing in order to move towards finding love in a marriage. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really just about, for me, it was about like tuning in with myself and figuring out what works for me and what doesn't work for me. What's really interesting though, is that even though I always had this confidence that I was going to find the right person, I didn't realize that many times I was actually self-sabotaging because I didn't realize the limiting beliefs that I had about myself and my weight and dating that was actually impacting the way I was dating. So just for example, like instead of, um, you know, giving a hot guy a chance to tell me he was interested in dating me, like I would reject him. I wouldn't even ask or I would reject him first because I didn't want him to reject me. Or because I just assumed that someone who looks like that wouldn't be interested in someone who looks like me. Or um, for a while, I was dating like all the wrong people. I, again, I was dating for marriage. So at that point, like I was dating people who I knew right off the bat, I would never marry and I would never want to marry. Because this way, it's inevit inevitable that the relationship is going to end. And I don't feel bad about it. Because it's not a rejection of me. It's it's a relationship that can't go anywhere and both of us knew it. So like things like that, where I was really self-sabotage, self-sabotaging without even consciously being aware of that's what I was doing. Um, and it actually like in that specific scenario, took a friend like looking me in the eye and being like, why are you dating all the wrong people? And he was like, there are, there are guys who are quality guys who are going to want to date you, but you need to give them a chance. And I was like, whoa. Um, so yeah. And it seemed like you weren't giving them a chance because of these limiting beliefs. Yeah. And it seems even though you had like this confidence and, you know, like <laughs> high self-esteem about you, there were mm -hmm. still these beliefs that like, because of their perception of who you are, right. that it wouldn't be a fit. And so of course, it, and it wasn't even perception. necessarily their perception of me. It was my projection of their oh, perception of me. Oh, oh geez. <laughs> your perception of their perception of you. Yes, exactly. Oh, and of course we, we, we don't want to be, nobody wants to be rejected, but that fear of rejection in order pr to protect yourself mm -hmm. from it, you just said, okay, next. Who's, <laughs> you know what I, and, and I get that. I so get that. Yeah. What helped you overcome that? What helped you like it, this friend looked you in the eye and is like, look, you need to date people that you feel like are actually this match that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, was that, was that a pivotal moment or how did you overcome these limiting beliefs? It's a really interesting question that I ask myself all the time because with my clients, I see a very clear trajectory of like limiting belief, emotion, behavior, action, result. Like I can put all the pieces together. I'm not so sure that it was that clear for me when I was in it. It was more once I was passive that I was able to look back and like kind of put the puzzle pieces together and create a system that works for other people as well. Yeah. Um, definitely that moment opened my eyes to the reality that, that 
maybe I can get what I'm looking for. Um, honestly, I met my husband while I was on a dating break. <laughs> like I was at a point where I was like, I'm going to take a break. I need to figure out some stuff in my personal life. Um, I was still on dating apps, but I was very upfront. Like right now I'm not dating for marriage. I'm open to, you know, whatever happens and anything could potentially happen in terms of like, well, maybe this really is the right one, but I wasn't intentionally dating for marriage at that point. Um, <laughs> so and we did end up meeting on a dating app and we um, met and right off the bat, I was like, whoa, there's something here. Like I've never dated anyone and had this kind of connection. And so I was like, and I kept going back and forth. And I was like, but I'm on a dating break for a reason. And like, I straight up told him, I'm like, this is what I need to figure out in my life before I can commit to a relationship. And he was like, yeah, all right, we'll figure it out together. And I was like, are you sure? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So that was kind of that. I definitely think that having, yeah, there were definitely, I would say there were some limiting beliefs that I recognized and that was helpful. And I'm sure that there were others that I didn't recognize right? Um, and partially got lucky or like, you know, God showed up and <laughs> yeah. sent him right when I needed him. Um, but yeah. I'm so glad that you bring God into this conversation because I am religious myself and I know that okay. a lot of people listening have a faith-focused background as well. And I think yeah. that's impossible to talk about love and relationships without God. Right. And you know, I think that really, yeah. yes, it, it just plays, there's something beyond ourselves that has to happen. Like when yeah. you're saying like, you know, like maybe there was this element of force, like dating for marriage. It's like, you know, working with matchmakers and being on the apps and like doing yeah. all the work. And maybe you would agree that there's some balance. And again, I'm not an expert. This is just me like thinking or mm -hmm. hypothesizing mm -hmm. or having theories, but like maybe there's some ebb and flow between like putting the work in for a relationship and letting the relationship come to you. And I think that there 100%, has to be hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I think, I think, I mean, we talk about like attracting the right kind of person, but a big part of that is just being open to it, right? Like just being yeah. in a place where I'm like, even if I'm not, I do believe very strongly in actively pursuing a relationship and, and taking action to help manifest that. But a big part of that process is just letting go of those limiting beliefs and saying like, okay, I'm ready for this. I'm yeah. open to whatever the process has to bring. Um, and what's really interesting is that um, I've actually, like most of my clients are Christian. And I think that there's something maybe that like, I, so I'm Jewish. I come from, from the Orthodox Jewish community. Yeah. Um, there's definitely some, there, there must be some elements of that, like religious faith-based approach to life that is attractive um, to them. But it's also really interesting to see how our values overlap. And some of those values are so mis misunderstood when it comes to health and size and relationships. And two of the things that really came up a lot for, for my clients. Um, and sometimes it took me, like I actively did my research because I was like, what is it in the Christian faith that's really bringing, that's really causing the Christians to struggle so much with this specific point. And so I went out and I was like doing some digging and the two things that came up most were um, gluttony, like gluttony being a sin. And so this assumption that if you're in a bigger body, you must be a gluttonous person. Okay. And if that's the case, then you're not someone that I want to marry, which is like total nonsense. <laughs> and the second one being that the body is a temple. And this is actually, um, this is actually a concept that resonates with me very much because we look at the body as a vessel for the soul. And so like my mission in this world is more of a spiritual one, the way that I see it, but I need my body. It's such an, without my body, I couldn't, you know, complete my mission in this world and I couldn't pursue my purpose. And so the body is so important. And so it becomes, well, if, if your body's the temple and you're fat, you must not be taking care of your temple properly. And how dare you? And how could you, if God is residing within you? And it's just like, yeah, but that's not actually how bodies or health work. Um, and so I think that those misunderstood concepts, even, even if I, on an intellectual level, recognize like, okay, I know that I can be healthy in a bigger body, 
when I've been brought up with this belief that like, oh, you must not be, you know, taking care of your body properly. If you're bigger, it's very hard to like, kind of bring those two ideas together because, and this is like something I say all the time to my clients, like I can know something in my head and I know something else in my heart. (laughs) And it's a matter of like a big part of what we do is bridging that gap between my head and my heart and starting to bring down what I know in my head into my heart. Yes. So, yeah. It's like really embodying our beliefs is what you're talking about. Like yeah. having that intellectual understanding, like isn't enough. We want to really yeah. put this on and embody it and yeah. know it as truth. And I see exactly what you're saying. And I, I, I love having this conversation about the roots of body stuff coming from faith and how there can be connections there, especially with, with gluttony and viewing our body as a temple, because generally we talk about these things coming from diet culture. Right. I think that we can talk about them stemming from maybe faith life as well in in these ways. And and there's a lot of parallels between faith and diet culture and food and body stuff coming Mm -hmm. up right now and how that impacts our ability to be open to love. Yeah. Yeah. I hear it often said that like, you know, we have to love ourselves before we can love someone else. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that statement? (laughs) Have you heard me talk about this? I haven't. I haven't. Oh, no way. (laughs) I've been like thinking about that in my mind. "Ah, I don't know about that. So I liked it for a long time. I genuinely really, it resonated with me for a long time because I do believe that self-love is so important. And there's actually a biblical verse like where we see this coming from. Um, the, uh, just, you know, cause since we're talking that, <laughs> um, and you shall, I'm trying to think of it in English cause I know it in Hebrew in my brain. Um, and you shall love another, like you love yourself. Yes. So the implication is that like you love yourself means you need to love yourself first in order to love someone else. So on a personal level, like this is something that I've been meaning to look into a little bit more cause it doesn't really make so much sense to me. Um, at this point in my life, but I think, I think, yes, self-love before other love is certainly a nice ideal. I don't think it's realistic. And I don't believe that it's a prerequisite for love, especially if there's a mental illness or trauma or anything like that, that someone's dealing with, because I, first of all, self-love is a lifelong process. Heck yeah. Like it's not something that like, Ooh, got it, nailed it. Good for life. Like, no. (laughs) So that's number one. But number two, like self-love is such a deep, um, I don't even know what the word for it is, but like, it's, it's a concept, it's a process, it's a reality that is not one that you can just like, you know, decide, oh, hey, this is something I want to explore and, and it's done. It's really, really a much longer up and down, roller coaster, yeah. twisted, inside out, and every which way process. Yes. And I do not believe, no, I do not believe that in order to love someone else and or in order to be loved, that you must fully like embrace self-love first. No, I don't. And I I I feel like it bothers me so much, especially in the body positive space, because it's self-love is so important and I love, love, love how popular it's becoming and that this is something that we are creating awareness about. And it's something that we're actively pursuing and it's something that we're introducing to people. And I think it's so important, but I hate that it comes along with the message of like, Oh, you need this first. And it generally comes from like the most well-intentioned people. Right. And it's like, no, hold on, take a step back. Cause that's not the way this works. I actually think about it in the inverse, like, can you still be loved when you don't love yourself? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like when, I mean, I've had breakdowns with my husband where I felt so distant from feeling an element of self-love myself. And Mm -hmm. it can be really healing to still have somebody like unconditionally love you. And I'm saying that from a place where like, gosh, I've struggled with food and body stuff much of my life. And now- because I'm in a relationship where there's a lot of healing that can take place within this container that we've set. It can be like, Oh, like he's here for me in that. Dang. Yeah. Actually this can help me get back into my window of tolerance. I can feel like I can be myself again. You know, like that's Mm -hmm. a really beautiful thing. So I think I love your perspective of like, 
It doesn't have to be a prerequisite. It's still something that we should strive for, right. but we can have it actually within the relationship when we feel like we can let in love from somebody else and feel that yeah. support. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's really that's so interesting. Awesome. I was actually doing a, like a little bit of like research, not, not like, not research, research, but just like anecdote, like personal, non-professional research for an article I was writing. And I was actually interviewing married women okay. and talking about self-love and body image um, within their relationship. And it was so interesting to me. This is going back, back, I don't know if it's like two or three years. Yeah. I found it so interesting how many women said that once they were in a relationship, once they were married, once they saw how much their husband really, really loves them was when they were able to start seeing their own beauty and start exploring that self-love. And I found that so interesting. And I think it was probably at that point where I was like, hold on, this self-love before other love doesn't really make sense. (laughs) Um, Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And it also brought up for me in my married life, different food and body stuff too. Yeah. It was like, oh, and there's a lot of healing and there's a lot of other stuff that comes up. For sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. There's so many layers. And I think think throwing out the term self-love as an all-encompassing term is really doing a solid disservice because there's so many different elements and so many different aspects to self-love yeah. that like, no one's ever going to get them all. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like no one's ever going to get them all at any given time. Yeah. Specifically, specifically when we're talking about bodies, I think body acceptance is like the most important. Yeah. Being okay with your body is amazing. Loving your body is cool, but I don't think it's a necessity. And it's really interesting because people have asked me, like, what do you think is more important? Like what comes first, body acceptance or body love? And, and I think the standard understanding is that body acceptance, you know, needs to come first. And once you've accepted your body, you can sort of um, explore love. And, and my specific journey was the opposite. Like I remember as a teenager standing in front of the mirror, totally naked, loving my curves because I've like, I, I used to quote Megan Trainer all the time and say like, I get all the right junk in all the right places. Um, and I, I do, I genuinely like love my body, thought I was sexy. And at the same time, still always wanted to lose weight because that's what I thought I needed to do. That's what I thought I was supposed to do. I thought that would make me even prettier and even sexier and even more beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to lie. There are moments where I think the same thing too now. Yeah. But I've accepted my body now. Like, this is who I am. I'm going to pursue health that may or may not affect my weight in different ways at different points in my life. Um, But now I can embrace the like body acceptance in addition to the, to the body love. And I think that for everyone, depending on where they are in their journey and what their experiences have been like and what their history is like, um, they're going to be at a different starting point and what they need to focus on is going to be different. So I think like saying self-love is every, like, is the, the important thing that needs to come first. I just don't think that's true. Yeah. I think but hey, that's just my opinion. <laughs> I love it. I think it's completely valid. I think that when we get ourselves stuck in like thinking like everything is linear, we get trapped, you yeah. know, we feel really stifled. Yeah. And yeah. I think that a real message that I'm getting from you right now that is so like inspiring is this like message of hope that like body acceptance is possible love is possible. You know, like enhancing your relationships is possible. Like enhancing the people, you know, like your connection to those you already love is possible through body acceptance too. The more we maybe accept ourselves, the maybe more love is possible, the more, you know, love we can invite in, the more that strengthens our relationships, the more, just as you said before, is like the greater ability we have to show up in the world, to do what we're flipping meant to do, you know? Yeah. That's and, so important. and sometimes it takes someone else to show us that. And that's okay yeah. too. That's okay too. Yeah. And it's still really hard a lot of the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> Most of the time is what you meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time. Um, and, and that's where it's really important to like have that support yeah. and, and to feel maybe like either, you know, like you have someone specifically, you know, that you can talk to that mm-hmm. like Sarah, like yourself and the services you provide, like that kind of support maybe faith support too, if that's something that's a part of your life, Mm -hmm. maybe, um, 
you know, like support from the movement realm, support from the intuitive eating realm. And like, yeah. there's so many different elements of support that you can have to feel like, yeah, you can inch toward body acceptance and greater love yeah. for yourself and others every day. Yeah. Yeah. I've 100%. Gotten, yes. I've just gotten chills like five <laughs> times, like during, just as you're talking through this episode, I just adore you and I'm on, I'm, you. I'm on fire for your approach and for what you do and how you help people and how you share your story. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for sharing that with everyone today. For can, sure. Can you tell, cause everyone wants to come and follow you on social media. Many of them want to work with you. They just want to know all about your new um, mindset work that you're doing as well. Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a program mm-hmm. laid out. So can you just give everybody all the deets on where they can find you at this point? Yeah, for sure. So I'm on Instagram at find love at any size with a dot between everyone. So find dot love dot at dot any dot size. Um, right now, this is actually super exciting. I have a five day free mindset makeover, which starts on the first. And I think this is being released on the fourth. So if you're hearing this now, um, you may have just missed it. But the good news is that I'm actually um, launching my first small group coaching program the week of Valentine's Day because I know how sucky it is to be single on Valentine's Day. And I think like that's probably when I wanted the most support. Not probably, it is. Um, and I'm so excited for that because up until this point, I've really been doing one-on-one work. And the part that was missing from that is that community element because this is not something that you're going through alone. You're not unique. <laughs> Um, and you're not the only one who's struggling with weight, stigma, and body image and dating. And so I think like getting the coaching part of it is going to be so powerful when it's combined with that community aspect. And so I'm really, really, really excited about that. So check it out. Um, I'm actually, I don't even know what the website name is probably love at any size.com. Um, that's where the, the current challenge is being hosted. So that's probably where you'll get the information, but either way, easiest way to reach me is just to shoot me a DM on Instagram and yeah, I'd absolutely love to have you in this very first, um, inner circle, uh, for fine love for love at any size. Find dot love dot at at dot dot. Any dot dot size size. dies. (laughs) Just search like Sarah Zolden also. Exactly. (laughs) Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. Will you come back to the kitchen table and talk more about love and relationships? We haven't even started the conversation. So yes, there is so much more to talk about for sure. Uh, We are both just like beaming and smiling. I'm doing fist pumps into the air. So pumped. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being here. My pleasure. Soon. Awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you.